Good morning, Mountain View. For those of you that don't know, my name is Cody. I'm the worship. Hi. I'm the worship pastor here. So being up here without a guitar is a little strange for me. Honestly, coming up after the worship music is a little strange for me. But here we are. I was tasked with ending out this series on Saul. And we have had a lot of amazing speakers so far throughout the series on how to squander your potential. And I hope that many of you taken away something from each of them in order to not, I repeat, not follow in Saul's footsteps. <laughs> As Scott said in week one, it is a very strange title for a message series. But nonetheless, I feel that I've gotten a lot out of it. And here we are at the very end. Today, we'll be walking through how to worship through the silence. You know, when I was talking to Mark before he left on sabbatical about this message, I kind of joked with him that uh, since this message is on silence, that I would just stand up here for 30 minutes and not say anything. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> silence. Some of us are comfortable with silence, and some of us are not. When I think of the word silence, I honestly think of my wife, Robin, and I. Um, I'm, I'm a person who likes silence. I'm a person who, let's say, is easily distracted. Yes. Whereas Robin is not. She is the queen of multitasking. See, when I'm home alone, there's nothing on. The TV's not on. I don't have music on. I don't have anything on. There's maybe a fan to give some white noise or you know, some, some of that. And I work that way. The silence allows my one-track mind to stay one, one direction. Okay? But there have been days, and very frequent days, where I come home from the church. Robin is laying on the couch. She has the TV going, an audio book playing. She's working on her reports. And she's talking on the phone with her mom. And she can do all of those things at the same time and tell me what happened in all of those situations. I have no idea how that happens. Because when I walk through the door, my eyes go straight to the TV and I hear no, nothing of what she says. She can be talking to me, but I don't hear it because I'm distracted by everything else that's happening around her. No, she's not like that. And I still don't understand how that works. Now, probably some of you who are married might be sitting here thinking, yes, that is my household. Well, I would relate to you in that sense. Now, silence can be good for some and bad for others. But what goes through your mind when I ask the question, have you experienced silence from God? Now, let's think for a second. Some of you may be thinking, when is God not silent? I mean, I can't hear what he tells me some of the time. Others may be thinking or feeling that God is silent on a particular prayer or a direction in their lives. Others even still might be thinking that they can't remember a time when God was silent. And if you are in that last boat, move over because I want to join you. When we experience silence from God, a lot can go through our minds. Maybe he doesn't care, or he isn't listening, or actually he doesn't have an answer. Now, none of those are true when we look at the promises of Scripture, but that doesn't mean that they don't go through our minds sometimes. And most recently, it's been going through mine. Recently, Robin has been having some, some different health things going on than she normally deals with. And I've spent a lot of time of prayer, even, even before all of this, just asking that the Lord would heal her body. 
There definitely have been times of frustration with the Lord and times of doubt. My faith has even wavered here and there. When God is silent and doesn't give us answers to what, he ask, what we ask of him, it can certainly test our faith. Some of us more than others. However, I was, as I was putting this message together, I realized that the Lord was teaching me at the same time he was giving me words to speak today. This message was honestly a healing experience for my faith and has altered my perspective moving forward in my life. So, with all that said, let's get into what I feel is the perfect message for today, starting in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 3. Scripture says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. Really quick, this is important to note. At this point in time, Saul has told all of the mediums and spiritists to leave. He doesn't want them. They're not allowed in Israel anymore. Okay, remember that for later. Starting in verse 4, the Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. So here we are. Saul's not getting any answers from God. He's not having any dreams, no word from prophets, no revelation from the Urim. And just in case you don't know what a Urim is, because I did not either, um, I looked it up, and the Urim is this white stone here. Often it had Hebrew text written on it. The black stone, which is its partner, is actually called a thumim. Okay? Um, these were tools used by the priests in the Old Testament to receive revelation from the Lord. If you want to do more research on them, um, there's a couple scriptures in Exodus that describe how they're used, and I'm sure you can find a lot on Google as well. Um, but <laughs> we're not going to get into all of that. Basically, in other words... Saul wasn't getting any answers, nothing at all. He was completely shut off from God at this point. So how does Saul respond? Well, let's look at verse 7. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium. Wait a second. Can you just imagine like one of Saul's advisors? He's like, hey, Saul, uh, buddy. Do you remember what you did back in verse 3? Like, you kind of told all those people to leave. Like, also, do you remember what it says in Leviticus 19.31? You know, do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. So what are you up to here? Like, not to mention this is probably the last person ever you should go to to hear from God. Well, long story short, Saul resorts to this sorcery, which is a sin, and who does Saul want to talk to? Not God. Samuel. Of all people. And Samuel asked Saul why he went to all of this trouble to talk to him. Saul tells him about the Philistine army, and Samuel responds with this, starting in verse 16. Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Lots of bad news that you do not want to hear. So let's look at this and break this down really quick. I mean, Samuel, at this point, has reiterated the fact that Saul's kingdom is being torn from him and given to David. And looking at one of the reasons that Psalm, or Samuel gives, uh, it's because Saul disobeyed God when it came to the Amalekites. 
And really, if we just go back to all of the messages that came before mine, we would see all of the ways that Saul has gone against and disobeyed and, and continued to do his own thing. And that's what we learn. Saul always does his own thing. He doesn't go before God. He doesn't repent. He doesn't ask the priest to give him godly advice. He doesn't seek the Lord in any way. And just as we have heard from other speakers in the past as well, Saul does not take ownership of his sins. So, now that we understand how Saul responded to silence from the Lord by completely ignoring it in some ways and ignoring God's commands, let's look at a couple of examples from the book of Psalms on how we ought to respond to silence from the Lord. Fittingly, both of these Psalms were written by David, the person to come after Saul. So starting in Psalm 13, it says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. And another example in Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. It is pretty clear when we read these that in both of these Psalms, God is silent. He's not answering. He's not answering the prayers, the petitions, the frustrations of what is going on in these situations. And we can all get that way, honestly. Maybe we don't go as far as saying that God has forsaken us, but I know that personally I have asked the question, how much longer, Lord? It is not wrong to feel frustrated when we experience silence from God. However, it is all about how we respond to that silence. As I was putting this message together, as I said earlier, the Lord gave me the idea of three R's to walk through when we experience silence from, from God. So let's start with the first R, reflect. Looking again at Psalm 13, we see one word after David writes his laments to the Lord, and the word is but. I'm sure some of you have heard before that this is a very important word in Scripture, and it's because it normally signifies a shift in the tone of what is going on, which is exactly what happens here when David writes, but I trust in your unfailing love. Now remember, just a couple of verses ago, David was saying, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And then he turns around and he says, but I trust in your unfailing love. David's down in the dumps, asking some pretty heavy questions with no answer. And instead of doing what Saul did and going his own way, he chooses to reflect on God's character and who he is. If we look again at Psalm 22, the same thing happens here in verse 3. It says, Yet you are enthroned as a holy one. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and they were not put to shame. See, we see the exact same thing here. If you just remember that yet is a fancy but. And in both, in both situations, there is time put aside to reflect on who God is and what he has done. When you're struggling, when you're confused, when you're frustrated, and you're not getting any answers from the Lord, take time to reflect on who he is and what he has already done in your life. Honestly, I think about the ways that God has provided for Robin and I, and I feel like I could easily make a list a few pages long of the ways that God has worked in, in both of our lives. So when we do this, when we take time to reflect on God, it puts us into a different mindset 
that no longer focuses on the problem that is in front of us and allows us to, in some ways, renew our faith in the Lord. No matter if we get an answer today, tomorrow, a month from now, a year from now, or I heard a story in, in between services of a decade from now. <laughs> Although oftentimes, when we take time to reflect on God's character, it actually brings us to the second R. Repent. Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You know, after we've taken time to reflect on the character of God and how he has worked in our lives, that should bring us to a place of personal reflection and revelation on how we might be working against the Lord. I mean, look back at Saul. You know, when we, when we read all of these stories of Saul, I think the one thing that honestly could have fixed a lot of Saul's problems is if he would have just taken, taken time to simply repent, to humble himself before the Lord and really just say, God, I messed up. I tried to go my own way. I tried to do it in my own strength. I made decisions that worked directly against the path you had set for me. Or if he would have taken time to reflect on scriptures and read in Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If we take time to repent, humble ourselves, and get things right with the Lord, that in and of itself might open the door necessary for you to receive an answer to your question in prayer. However, that is not a guarantee, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> Sometimes God's timing is what reveals that answer rather than a verbal or confirmed answer from others or from God directly. And in those times of waiting, we simply just have to wait on the Lord. But in those moments, we continue to pursue him, reflecting on who he is, repenting for what we've done, and just simply waiting on his timing and trust that he has your best interest in mind. So this morning I felt that it would be appropriate as we've taken time to talk about reflecting on God and repenting of a sin in our life to take communion as a body. This is also the moment where I hand it off down to, down to Jeff at the Orange Campus to lead you all through communion together and close this message on the last R for the day. Have a blessed time down there. Thank you, brother. Now, if you've not grabbed communion, a communion cup before coming in, they're at the back table um, by the doors. Um, so we'll take a second in case there are some that need to grab one. Hey, Casey. It's really hard to see with these lights up here sometimes. <laughs> so as we've talked about this morning, communion is a time of reflection. Jesus, at the Last Supper, said to his disciples about communion to do this in remembrance of me. You know, that seems right there like a pretty straightforward command to reflect on the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. The scripture also states in 1 Corinthians 11.28, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So communion, in essence, is a time of remembrance of Christ, but also a time of personal reflection and repentance. So before we take communion this morning, I wanted to just put into practice the first two R's. So over the next little bit here, let's take some time to reflect on who God is, his character, 
and how he has been a part of our lives. Let's reflect on the Lord this morning. And now that we have reflected on God, let's take time to repent for for the ways that we have gone against the Lord in, in recent memory. As you open the bread part of the cup, which is under this little piece of cellophane or plastic or whatever the heck you call this, (laughs) Jesus, while sitting with the disciples, he took the bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of Jesus this morning. He then took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink this morning in remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice. Now oftentimes we take communion Toward the end of the service, the band comes up and we play a song and everybody leaves. But if you remember, I said there were three R's and we've only still talked about two. So the last R will actually set up the time of worship as we close out the service today because that R is rejoice. So if we look back at Psalm 13 and Psalm 22 again, At the end of each of those psalms, David takes time to give praise to the Lord and rejoice. As it says in Psalm 13, My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord's, I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. And again, it says in Psalm 22, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. You know, David, after reflecting on the Lord, was brought to a posture of rejoicing and worship because of who God is. There is a quote by N.T. Wright. It says, The closer you get to the truth, the clearer becomes the beauty, and the more you will find worship welling up within you. That's it right there. The closer we get to the truth of God, his character, his love, his grace, his holiness, his sacrifice, and the closer we get to the truth of who we are, the ones who chose to sin against him, the ones who continue to sin against him, the ones who chose thousands of years ago to say, this is what I want for myself, not what God wants for me the ones who departed from the Lord. The closer we get to those truths, the clearer the beauty of the cross becomes. (laughs) His sacrifice to bring us back to him. Not because we are deserving of it, but because he loves us.
this is when you will find worship and rejoicing welling up within you. He is worthy of praise always and forever. Amen? (laughs) So this morning as the band comes and joins me on the stage, we have talked through two different examples of silence from the Lord outside of Saul's story that met it with a completely different approach than what Saul had. Saul chose his own path. He broke the Lord's commands and still in the end chose to ignore God and speak with Samuel rather than to God. While David in these Psalms decided to take a breath, reflect on God's promises, his past provisions, live his life humbly and repent when he knew he was in the wrong and ultimately Take time to rejoice in the Lord, giving praise to God for what he has done and what he will do. After taking time to reflect and repent, the natural response should be to rejoice, just as we read in that quote. The closer we become to the truth, or the closer we come to the truth, the more worship wells up within us. God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. His promises are true. His word is secure. And he will always have our best interest in mind. That is why this message is titled, Worship Through the Silence. Because these three R's in practice bring us to a place of worship. So as we close out this service today, with this song, I encourage you all to rejoice. Because what frees us from squandering our potential is maintaining a habit of the three R's and making sure we make time and space to reflect, repent, and rejoice in the Lord. I will say that if there is anyone here today that just needs prayer, or wants to come forward and pray with me. I'll be standing up here in front. Otherwise, let's all stand. Let's rejoice together and let the house of the Lord sing praise this morning. Let's worship.